I'm not at home on crowded streets. They don't appeal to me. In the heart of God's cathedral is where I want to be. So I take the outside circle when the stars are growing dim. See the morning light play shadows all along the canyon rim. I feel the prairie wake and flush a dozen bob white quail as I guide my favorite cow horse down a rough and rocky trail. I ride through mountain country, gaze across the great divide as I trail majestic mustangs that no man will ever ride. A red-tailed hawk is screaming as he searches for his prey. And the cottonwoods are yellow on this crisp November day. I crave the open spaces where the sky is blue and wide. Somewhere west of Wall Street is where my heart and soul reside. Hi, I'm Red Stegall. Join me as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street. Today, we're going to visit the National Ranching Heritage Center on the campus of Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas. In the fall of 1966, Texas Tech President Grover Murray invited several ranchers, community leaders, and scholars to a meeting at Lubbock's Pioneer Hotel. W.C. Holden, the Texas Tech Museum's first director and the founder of the Southwest Collection, was there. Prominent ranchers included Frank H. Chapel Jr. of the Rinda Brook Spade Ranches, John Lott of the U Lazy S, and D. Burns of the Pitchfork. President Murray wanted them to consider a novel idea. The university was about to start construction on a new facility for their old museum. They had picked a site on the edge of campus, convenient to both students and public. Next door, was another piece of ground over two dozen acres. Why not, he asked the group, why not use that piece to create a museum about ranching? Not a museum building housing ranching artifacts, but a museum built of buildings. Why not relocate the historic ranching structures themselves, fit them out correctly, and let them tell the story? The group was all for it. The physical evidence documenting the first century of American ranching was rapidly disappearing. Here was a chance to preserve it. Everyone set to work. The Ranching Headquarters Association, forerunner of today's Ranching Heritage Association, was formed by 1970. Ranchers immediately donated several structures, often putting up their own money to move and reassemble them. By its formal dedication during the bicentennial, the Young Ranching Heritage Center numbered 18 buildings, four windmills, and several corrals, all fully restored and open to the public. Now, almost 50 years after that first vision, the National Ranching Heritage Center has grown to just about that many structures with a full range of programs and events for scholars and families and for history buffs like me. Stockmen and farmers moved onto the plains of Texas after 1874. In a land that was considered by many early explorers as unfit for human habitation, the plains have become the breadbasket of the world. And even after the Indians who inhabited the plains country were moved to reservations in Oklahoma Territory, the lives of the settlers were still at risk. And they continued to survive at the mercy of the elements, especially storms and drought. The National Ranching Heritage Center is dedicated to those early settlers who persevered to create an amazing agricultural society that's the envy of the world. My friend Andy Wilkinson joins me as we explore the evolution of human habitation on the Great Plains. Join us on this amazing journey. But Andy, let's talk about how the, ranching her the National Ranching Heritage Center came about. I'd love to, Red, because it's such an interesting story. Uh, it's been almost 50 years, fall of 1966, president of Texas Tech, Grover Murray, had an idea about creating a museum about ranching, and not a museum inside a building, but a museum made of buildings. Yes. You know, how could we save the structures? And so he invited some community leaders and several really key ranch, uh, ranchers, uh, John Lott, uh, Frank Chapel, D. Burns, Robert Snyder, and uh, they all got together in the fall of 1966. and. Uh, it was an instant hit with everybody involved, and uh, Texas Tech provided the land and the operating funds, and ranchers started putting money together and donating buildings. And 
the first buildings were coming in within a little over a, a year from that. So it's a really remarkable story. Almost 48, uh, or 48, I guess almost 50, 48 structures here today. That's a lot of stuff. Yes, it is. And it's very interesting. And it traces the evolution of human habitation on the plains mm -hmm. through from the time that the, the matador of the cowboys built a dugout and all the rest of the cowboys who came onto the Great Plains lived in dugouts. And you've told me that most of them stayed outside in their teepees, I mean their teepees and uh, <laughs> bedrolls. But when yeah. it really got bad, they went inside. Yeah, yeah well, we've, we've, we've seen inside the dugout and uh, you can see why you'd prefer to sleep outside. Oh my gosh, it, even if it was raining and you were inside, you were yeah. still getting wet. Yeah, and plus they knew that uh, full dugouts, so, of which uh, they didn't do too much out here on the plains because they had just enough terrain to do half dugouts like the Matador half dugout. But a full dugout with a sod roof was a dangerous place. Roofs would cave in, especially when it was wet. And then you had uh, rattlesnakes and uh, mice and uh, spiders, whatever else, because uh, they wanted to get in out of the wind. <laughs> Possums and raccoons and, and, and uh, whatever. lizards and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. And, and you know, cattle fell through the top of those things too because they walked off the that, side yeah. of the hill onto that. Grazing road. on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, the, the uh, dugout were, was a primitive shelter, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's all they had. And they built their, their structures and their homes out of materials that were available. And the things that were available were, were stone mm -hmm. and very few logs on the plains. You yeah. could find some cottonwoods down along the creeks, but log cabins were kind of a, uh, they were a real nicety, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they happened somewhere else. You know, uh, out here, this part of the country, the, what we think of the big ranching country uh, on the plains, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're right, they had to use what they could. Uh, if you got a little bit off the cap down in, in the Brazos River country, like there's one uh, building here, the Joel House, which is a interesting two-story structure limestone and they quarried it not uh, just a few miles away from the site but you'd uh, out here for instance you'd have to go a long way for limestone and that sure. that building alone there's 90 tons of limestone and you can't imagine putting that in a wagon and carrying it out to you know to this country but stones they use stones a lot mm -hmm. and you know even in south texas they use the sotol stalk i mean it, and uh, they just made places to stay out of whatever they had available. What changed all of that? Well, and, you know, I, I got to thinking about that and I realized that we wouldn't be here without the wind, you know. Uh, the soil that's out here is aeolian deposit. All that great soil that makes this great grass. So there's that. Then you dug the dugout to get away from the wind. Yes. Uh, but then at some point, somebody said, you know, if we had a windmill, we could pump water. Uh, with the wind and that started making a difference because with a windmill you could have a range in a place that didn't have a natural supply of water. You could pump it up and you could bring a railroad out because the rail, you know, railroads were steam locomotives at the time and they had to, about every 20 miles they had to have a new fresh supply of water you bet. and they got it with a windmill. We've got a, a building here, the J.A. Meat and Milk House. Oh, yeah. From the J.A. Ranch in the Paladier mm -hmm. Canyon. And uh, the windmill on the hill pumped the water down through that mm -hmm. building so that they keep their food supply cool. That was another use for the windmill besides yeah. just providing water for the stock. It had a trough and ran the uh, water through and you'd set your butter and your eggs and your milk mm -hmm. and then hang meat uh, in, the, in the room next to it. Another thing, too, that uh, a lot of people don't understand is you can drill a well and you can hit water not too deep, but it a lot of times is a salt deposit, mm -hmm. a gypsum deposit, and it's really unfit for humans and unfit yeah. for livestock. Yeah. But you're going down below that 16 foot cap is the Oglala Aquifer, mm -hmm. which is a supply of fresh water yeah. that we've been using to provide food stuff and take care of us for generations. So the windmill was extremely important, and uh, so then the fence, the yeah, wire. wire. Wire, and of course with the wind uh, to pump the water and the rail cars to deliver the wire, or at least get it close enough that you can mm -hmm. bring it with a short wagon ride, now you had a way to fence a pasture. And you could keep your cattle from drifting in the winter. Uh, you could separate your, uh, uh, you know, the bulls from the cows. You could uh, 
uh, move the cattle around. You could keep yours separate from your neighbors. And uh, so the wire was, an, and, and keep it separate from the farms that were starting to crop up, which started pretty early out yes. here on the plains. So the wire was incredibly important. Um, we have out here at the National Ranching Heritage Center the uh, Matador, uh, Los Escarbadas uh, bunkhouse and office. And, and you think about, uh, not the Matador, the XIT, you think about the, uh, uh, the XIT and the first thing that I always think about is 6,000 miles of wire. <laughs> that's a lot of wire. That's, that's 1,500 miles of a five-strand barbed wire fence. Yeah. The, the main thing that created the wealth and the uh, next step up the ladder for agriculture, especially livestock in our part of the world, was the ability to fence off our the cattle that we wanted to improve. We could bring in different breeds from Europe primarily or from the East Coast where they had already brought in the Hereford and the Angus and, mm -hmm. and the Shorthorn and the Gelvy and, mm -hmm. and all the wonderful breeds that we use today to provide our meat and milk. But we couldn't, we brought them out on the plains and we had to be able to isolate those herds. Sure. So the wire did that. Mm -hmm. And the windmill gave us the ability mm -hmm. to separate those animals because we didn't have to depend on a natural water source, yeah. which there are very few. Very few. There are and, seasonal pies. Uh, yeah, and, and when they are, uh, when there's water, it is seasonal. Andy, let's talk more about the, the wind, the wire, and the rail, because those are the three things that really made a difference in the lifestyle, the homes, the way they did business, the way they marketed their products. Our early settlers depended on those three things more than anything else. Yeah, exactly. and. And they used them because they came together at the same time. If we'd have had any one by itself, it wouldn't have really helped without the others. You had to have the wires we talked just a few minutes ago to fence off the pastures. And you had to have the rail to deliver the wire. You had to have the water so the rail mm -hmm. would run and the water so you could fence off and have, have a water source. But then, what are you going to do with those cows? What are you going to do with your cattle? You know, uh, before they were driving them to market. Yes. Uh, and now, especially with wire, uh, you can't do that. So the rail was an extremely important thing in terms of having a point to ship the cattle from. And uh, that changed everything, you know, because the, the shipping points became cities and t or towns and cities and it gave us a place for to, to really make a permanent settlement out of something that in a lot of ways had been pretty temporary up to that point. We've come a long way and uh, we still continue to make advances technologically and and building and architecturally uh, but this facility is the greatest example of the ingenuity and perseverance and mm -hmm. dedication of an agricultural society anywhere in the world and I always urge people to, to come here and look at it. So. Uh, we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to take a long trip through the National Ranching Heritage Good. Center and we're going to look at some individual buildings. Great. You folks stay with us. We'll be right back. Andy, let's talk about some specific buildings and the history of the people who built those homes or buildings for their livestock or something. Who were the people that came out on the plains? What kind of people were they? Were they from the East Coast? Were they from Europe? Were they from East Texas? What kind of people were they? Were they Celtic, Germanic? Yeah. Uh, growing up out here, we thought people from East Texas, that was, that was Europe, that was that far away. <laughs> but it was a long way out here. You know, uh, coming up from uh, uh, the typical pattern for migration in Texas was the frontier, wherever that was, which was Tennessee or Illinois, and then back down to Texas. And then in Texas, uh, they went to the east part of the state and then they came up to the uh, hill country around Palo Pinto County, uh, Weatherford, which uh, later on mineral wells. And, uh, and then from there they came west and north out to the ranching country. And uh, we have, gosh, we got some great examples of uh, that progression. The Joel House, which is uh, uh, one of my favorites, uh, two-story limestone quarried limestone, that was one we mentioned earlier, that uh, the limestone was taken from the creek that was built on just a mile or a few miles away from the house. And they built that house in, in 1872 because they were uh, fresh 
out of the Indian troubles, the troubles that they had with the Comanche right around the time of the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, and where houses had been burned out, and, and they weren't defensible because you could hole up in it, but if you're in a wooden house, you know, uh, you, you, you can be burned out. So they built it out of stone, put rifle slits uh, in it so that they could defend it, and uh, uh, then never had to worry about it. <laughs> you know, and then you go from one like that to uh, another one of my very favorites is the 80 John Wallace. I wanted you to tell about that. Oh, he, uh, his, uh, because I think of uh, all of these structures as being not so much a structure, but uh, a symbol for the stories that go with it. And 80 John, born in 1860, black man, uh, born to slave parents, ran away at 15 because he didn't like working cotton. He said a man wasn't built uh, to work <laughs> bent over. He was built to work straight up like on the saddle of a horse. And he ran off uh, to be a cowboy and he worked for a fellow named Clay Mann who had a brand, the 80 brand. And, uh, and uh, 80 John, whose name was Daniel Webster Wallace became 80 John because he was the, the, the man that did the branding, put that 80 on, on the hips of all those cattle. And so he earned that nickname, stuck with him the rest of his life. You know, you, you hear a story like that and you think, this is remarkable. He builds this house and he builds it in the shape of a cross, partly I think because he was religious, but also because uh, in that country, they don't have quite the wind we do. Uh, so in the summertime, you've got to catch it. and any way the wind is coming from on that house, you're going to catch the breeze. And that's an, a, something really important in their construction and the kind of houses they build, whether it was a, uh, a wooden house or whether it was made out of stone or whether it was made out of adobe. We've mm -hmm. got an adobe building here. Our so told stocks, uh, it doesn't make any difference. You had to depend on the elements to keep you cool because mm -hmm. I always say that if you want to go back to the good old days, turn off your air conditioner. That's right. <laughs> but these people were uh, they had perseverance, they were, had ingenuity, they took care of themselves, they built beautiful homes that will, were mansions. The Barton House mm -hmm. is, a, is a mansion. And uh, this facility preserves the image of the men and women who settled the plains and had the grit and determination to mm -hmm. stay here and make it the most beautiful spot on this mm -hmm. earth. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the Barton House. Uh, that brings up a, a, another aspect of these homes, too, um, is that they were all built with an eye to the future. You know, when the people built houses out of Sotal, they knew it wasn't going to last. They'd have to replace it, but it was there to keep it going for the next thing. Same with the dugout. When you look at the house, you realize that it's not just uh, an, a, a pretty house, a, a, an imposing structure but it's also a symbol for something that they expected to happen in the future. You know, Andy, we've talked about everything that's outdoors and all of the, the buildings that were moved here and all of the ranchers who contributed to the uh, financial need to move those buildings and reconstruct them. But inside the ranch, National Ranching Heritage Center, we've got some unbelievable displays. Oh, yeah. And uh, the spur collections. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some of Quanta Parker's Mm -hmm. uh, things. Uh, we have the bedroom of uh, Burke Burnett. Yeah. And uh, I think that we should encourage people to see everything that's indoors as well as all the buildings outdoors. Oh, you bet. Hope you enjoyed our trip back in time to the plains of Texas. We're the luckiest people on earth. The Lord gave us the knowledge, the determination, and the ability to provide the most economical, efficient, and safest food supply on earth. You know, in 1897, William Jennings Bryan said, burn your cities, save your farms and ranches. Your cities will grow back as if by magic, but burn your farms and ranches, and grass will grow in the streets in every city of America. Thanks for riding along with us. We hope we taught you something about the cowboy you didn't know or maybe brought back an old memory. Before we leave you, I want to give you something to think about till next week. A government big enough to give you everything you want is strong enough to take everything you have. Gerald Ford left that with us. You folks be sure and listen for us on your local radio station for Cowboy Corner every week and join us here again as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street. Adios, my friend.